This is the Media Police Post from the Fort Hall School of Government. In this show, we police the state of truth in the Republic. And because truth is communicated to us by journalists and analysts, we have made it our civic duty to put it to the test. And we advance from two confirmed truths about the media. One, and in the words of Roger Stone, the media is either lazy or evil. And for the most part, it is both evil and lazy. That is why the truth, their truth, must be put to a test. Two, another confirmed truth is that journalism is verified gossip. In fact, what is presented to us as news analysis is gossip that has been verified by journalists. This gossip has to be ground truthed. We will monitor columnists. We will assess the state of truth in what they submit to the Republic. And we will pass verdict on what is true and what is not. For the record, we are not journalists. We are thinkers. We are not lazy or evil. And we do not verify gossip. What we give you is the truth. The truth that sets you free. On today's show, we will discuss a few things. Either our favorite columns of last week or columns which reflect unformed and uninformed opinions. And columns that made you stupid. These are the columns that A. fell into the trap, the cognitive trap of we see things as we are, not as they are. B. Those that are based on conjuncture history. And C. Ones that smack of envelope journalism. Welcome, Miss K and CS. What will you be reviewing today? Santi. Santi Sana, thank mm. you so much. <coughs> well, this week I felt uninspired by the columns of the previous week. They were uh -huh. either favorite, unformed, uninformed. However, <laughs> the deputy president hosted members of the creative industry over the weekend to discuss yeah. their concerns as well as receive their suggestions and proposals for the current situation in the country. Mm -hmm. And the DP's meeting reminded me of a story. Mm -hmm. It's a story about those who are destined to inherit power but who seek to disinherit themselves through over eagerness. Uh -huh. and self-promotion. Mm. It's a story about a man who sought to undermine his boss at every opportunity. Mm. It's a story from the Bible about a gentleman called Absalom. <laughs> and when Absalom was readmitted yes. into the king's court, yes. David's court, after being pardoned for the murder of his brother, he spied an opportunity to claim his father's throne. Mm. So without his father's permission, Absalom positioned himself as the king's representative to adjudicate the disputes of the Israelites mm -hmm. and his intention was not to lighten his father's burden by deputizing him it was to gain political currency for himself mm -hmm. so near the city gates he set up a parallel court where he met the people of Israel mm -hmm. so when people would come to see the king to have some matter settled he would divert them saying the king was too busy with development Ooh. but he had time to listen to their problems and Absalom conducted this guerrilla campaign for four years straight and by the end of it he had won the hearts and minds of Israel by undermining his father on the fifth year Absalom retreated to his political stronghold to launch a coup in a matter of weeks Absalom was able to put together a powerful coup making coalition first he brought hundreds of Jerusalem's bourgeoisie with him mm -hmm. then he sent for the king's chief advisors mm -hmm. all the president's men mm -hmm. and Absalom's support base became so strong that the king had to flee the capital Jerusalem and so the coup carried out over a period of four years in small installments where Absalom chipped away at the credibility of the king it finally succeeded I have to say this, the parallels between the story of Absalom and the seeming rise and rise and rise of William Ruto <laughs> over the eight years of the Uhuru presidency yeah. are striking. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So first, the DP propagated the myth that Uhuru was lazy and incompetent, and he never denied the rumor that he was the one running the country. Mm. Then he raided Uhuru's political backyard, just like Absalom did. 
now and we could be wrong the deputy president has instituted an open door policy for those who feel slighted by the Uhuru Kenyatta government but here is a lesson for the deputy president from the Absalom story mm -hmm. once Absalom's ambition his self promotion and his treachery were revealed he lost the kingdom the DP should not let his Absalom spirit lead him to a premature loss. Well said. <laughs> I also want to talk about the Deputy President <clears throat> and the unholy alliances mm. he has been forming. Now, because crime is common mm -hmm. and logic is rare, this Monday I'd like us to connect some dots. Mm -hmm. Number one. Shortly after the president launched the BBI report, which had taken two years to put together, Deputy President slammed fresh demands on the table, which he called his five irreducible minimums to be met for him to support BBI. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, this included IBC's role in determining the 70 new constituencies. He also took issue with the proposal to elect 47 women to Senate. Mm -hmm. And we will analyze his three other demands on a different day. But for now, let us focus on the 70 constituencies and the 47 women sen senators. But also remembering that he complained many times about additional MPs and positions. Mm -hmm. Number two, on the 17th of March 2020, six months after the BBI launch and four months after officially receiving the bill, Chebukati decided to tell us the proposed 70 new constituencies were unconstitutional, that it was IABC's work to determine new constituencies and that Kenyans in all their sovereignty had no business getting involved. Mm. In light of this, on the 23rd of March, we at the Fifth Estate told you that Chebukati is exhibiting suspect behavior and that we <laughs> smell a rat. <laughs> now, bearing in mind that the 70 new constituencies were aimed at resolving unfair resource allocation and to align representation with the population distribution and des density, the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, relying on data from the 2019 census, told us that the 70 proposed new constituencies were just about right, though they proposed 68 instead of 70. But KNBS also needed data from IEBC to validate this. Guess what? Chabukati refused, saying IABC cannot share data with another government agency. At the K. Aya. <laughs> On 10th December, the BBI bill, accompanied with 4.4 million signatures, were handed over to IABC. Mm. The Constitution entrusts IABC to do two things verify the signatures and deliver the bill to the county assemblies. That's right. Simple. Yeah. Never mind that Chabukati had taken issue with the 70 new constituencies. Never mind that Chabukati refused to share data with KNBS that would better inform the allocation of the 70 new constituencies. Mm -hmm. Somehow, somehow, between the draft being handed over to IABC and it getting to the county assemblies, 34 county assemblies received draft bills with errors. But as far as the IABC is concerned, the errors made their way into the bill like manna from heaven. Yet quite interestingly, the errors conveniently touched on three issues. 70 new constituencies, composition of parliament, and voting by delegation, which affects the 47 proposed women senators. Read on with this. Why do these errors align so conveniently with Ruto's and Chebukati's tantrums? Finally, after the errors were discovered, the Joint Justice and Legal Affairs Committee of Parliament rubbished the typos and concluded they are a non-issue. But in the same breath, they are also now saying that there are questions regarding the constitutionality of the proposed 70 new constituencies. Mm -hmm. My conclusion, Judas used a kiss, Brutus used a knife, Ruto will use everything plus the kitchen sink but if he uses a knife he will use a borrowed one <laughs> very very interesting proposition there i'm William also wondering Ruto. i'm really wondering how 47 counties got at the same bill apparently but 34 of them got a copy from the window mm. the Ruto trabocati access 
there's much to investigate there we'll talk about it continue talking about it tomorrow now today i would like to concur with and buttress the weekend column of daisy maritim minor who begged the question will ruto's new marketing manager deliver now last week william ruto hired yet another economist professor jona dongo professor dongo has been assigned the task of developing a hustler model for economic advancement or what William Ruto calls bottom-up economics. I'd like to put both economists on the spot and by both here, the second one is David Day, who's already on his payroll here. Yeah? I'll get him in a bit. First, regarding Governor Dongo, let me say two things. Number one, he is a rightist. Throughout his entire professional life, Governor Ndongo has advocated for the trickle-down economic model. Now that is the economic school of thought which holds that taxes on businesses and the wealthy in society should be reduced as a means to stimulate business investment. According to this model, the more economic activity there is, the more crumbs, the more crumbs mm -hmm. there are for those at the bottom of the pyramid to benefit from. Now, it is the complete opposite. This is the complete opposite of the William Ruto bottom-up economic model. And I ask, dear Kenyans, was it not Ruto who showed us his payslip the other day? Was it not Ruto who told us that if he became president, he would become Robin Hood by raising taxes on the rich to redistribute to the poor. You see, what William Ruto uh, stands for is the complete opposite of what Governor Dongo has advocated for all his life. This doesn't add up. Number two, I would be remiss if I did not remind you, dear Kenyans, that Governor Joanna Dongo was in 2011 rated Africa's worst central bank governor on account of his inability to manage astronomical inflation, interest rates, and foreign exchange rates. They were the highest during his tenure. It was under his watch that the commercial banks made stupendous profits. In fact, I am actually inclined to think the reason why this, uh, the, par the last parliament passed the law which capped interest rates is because of what happened in his tenure. You're very right. It is also on record, as Daisy mentioned in this piece, that a lot of scandals took place at the central bank under his tenure. So, William Ruto sufferers, or hustlers as you like to call yourselves, Tongo will only milk you dry. <laughs> now, over to David Day. He authored the rightest 2003 economic recovery strategy paper for wealth and employment creation. Once again, I ask, did he have a Damascus moment? When, if so, you know? Since when did he, like William Ruto, embrace the bottom-up Marxist approach of Karl Marx? He's not a Marxist, he's a rightist. But this inconsistency is not even the most damning thing. The most damning thing is what Kibaki said when he read David Ndee's paper because he authored that draft, the first draft that went to Kibaki. We have it on good authority that when Mze Kibaki saw it, he was appalled. In shock, he said, who wrote this damn paper? It reads like a first year economics essay. Mze trashed David Ndee's draft and he asked his peers for finance to start afresh. That was the work of David Day, downright mediocre, and nothing has changed. Finally, it's very obvious what William Ruto is doing. Ruto is not interested in retaining intellectuals. His sole intention is to buy the Kibaki credentials in order to slight Uhuru Kenyatta. His only motivation, 
is malice. Mm -hmm. If it Period. works like a rightist, it works like a rightist, it writes like a rightist. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> rightist. Yes, and he's behaving completely suboptimal here. Mm -hmm. You know, you uh, advocate for bottom-up approach, but you hire people who have all throughout their life advocated for uh, top-down thinking. I do agree with you, and I feel like it's an insult to the Kenyan people. He's insulting your collective intelligence by letting you know that you do not know who your economists are. They're masquerading as one Absolutely. thing, and they're going to do a very different thing that will bleed you dry. I, I like the Robin Hood analogy. <laughs> uh, I won't complete why, but I like the Robin Hood analogy. That's what he, that's what he advocated for. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on Media Police Post Columnists. Join us next week for yet another episode. And columnists, we are putting you on notice. We are watching you. Good night. <laughs>